On behalf of Titan Television Channel 57 and 90.3 WRSTFM Oshkosh, we are your, ho your hosts, Eric Balkman and Callie Mills. We'd like to welcome you to the third annual Pro Perspectives Industry Panel at UW Oshkosh. In the next hour, we'll be talking to five Radio TV Film alumni about the industry. Today, we'll explore everything from applying for jobs to industry secrets to career advancement. Let's dive in and introduce our panel. Our first panelist is a 1982 graduate and is now president of his own company, Betcher Media Group. His work has appeared nationally on NBC, CBS, and ESPN. Let's give a warm welcome to the five-time Emmy winner, Steve Betcher. Our next panelist is a 2001 graduate joining us from WTMJ, where he started as a producer and worked his way up to the sports anchor of the station's morning show. The winner of ESPN's reality show, Beg, Borrow, and Deal 2, please welcome Greg Matzik. A 2007 RTF grad, our third panelist, has quickly advanced from a general assignment reporter to a news anchor at Newswatch 12 on WJFW television. Let's welcome Dana Blado. Our next panelist is a 1981 graduate and has had 26 years of experience in the industry as a producer for WLUK-TV in Green Bay and currently oversees staffing for the station. Give a warm welcome to Assistant News Director Bill Kiefer. Our final panelist is joining us all the way from Los Angeles. Graduating in 2004, this freelance cinematographer has worked in feature films, television, music videos, and commercials. Honored with the 2011 Emerging Cinematographer Award from the International Cinematographers Guild, please welcome Michael Nye. <laughs> to begin the panel today, uh, we want to take you back to when you were in our shoes here uh, at, uh, at uh, UW Oshkosh. How involved were you in the student organizations here? And I'll start with Michael, if you want to comment on that. Uh, well. My focus was very film oriented and uh, so I'll be honest, I didn't spend a lot of time up in uh, WRST or in the Titan TV studio, but uh, I spent a lot of time and, t and energy uh, at film society meetings and uh, I guess I poured a lot of my attention into that. Um, and also would, uh, international film series was something that I would attend occasionally, but um, it's pretty much where I geared my focus. Bill, what about you? Uh, I was pretty much a radio rat. I spent uh, almost all of my work uh, waking hours at WRST. Um, just a lot of great hands-on experience in the news department, um, on air as a DJ, and I spent a, a semester as the station manager, student station manager. So. And Dana? I, even though my passion has always been for news, I knew that since high school, I tried to tip my hand in a little bit of everything just because I think contacts in this business are so important. And even if your passion is in one area, you never know where those other contacts are going to lead and the extra knowledge never hurts. How about you, Greg? Uh, you know, I wasn't nearly as involved, uh, to be perfectly honest. The radio was all I had time for because I ran track and I was in a fraternity, so I was pretty involved in a lot of other things. Um, Three o'clock was practice time, so I couldn't be involved with TV as much as I wanted. Film was a significant amount of time, but radio I could kind of plan my own schedule a little bit better. Um, and I wanted to be great at all three things that I did, um, with the fourth thing being school, of course. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it just, you know, I was trying to diversify myself as much as possible. So, I mean, radio is pretty much everything that I dove into on, on this side. I wish I had done more. I wish I had time to do more. And Steve? I spent a lot of time in the television and film area. I hung around all the time in these hallways <coughs> and spent a lot of time in the studio. So I was here a lot for the television and film program. And Greg, maybe this is a question best asked for you, but was there anything maybe that you wish you would have done had you had the time in, you know, be it a student organization or in the RTF program while you were a student there? Yeah, you know, I think I would have liked film a little bit more. Working in radio at the station I work at, TV is, I mean, right down the hallway. So I'd, um, I get pretty involved in our TV broadcast news with um, different sports angles that they want to feature. Uh, but film is so unique, and I had Doug Heil for a couple different classes. I saw Doug back there before, but uh, and he's brilliant. I mean, he's a great mentor, a great guy to learn from, and I wish I could have picked his brain a little bit more in that regard. And Dana? I think I would have probably, had I had more time, delve more into the radio and possibly film. Again, my focus was always for news, but I would have liked to have a little bit more of a general knowledge of those areas. 
Bill, you being up at WRST so much, maybe something else you would have yeah, liked to do? Yeah, uh, definitely, you know, looking back over it, would have liked to have probably spent more time in the television side of it. Um, I was very involved in a, a lot of the news gathering at WRST, which I loved, but uh, maybe a little bit more on the technical side of things. Hey, Michael? Not to be a one-trick pony, but it was more film. Like, I had a conversation <laughs> with Doug uh, the year before I was about to graduate. Hey, do you think maybe I should stay on another year, another semester maybe? I can shoot another project. <coughs> and uh, We had a heart-to-heart, -heart and ultimately I moved on. But, um, yeah, I was pretty infatuated with that side of things. It's kind of interesting to hear him say that because that's how it seemed like when we are going through classes. You guys might agree. Like, film, when you're in it, man, you are in it. But the way it works in the industry now is there is so much crossover between radio and TV that it, it almost pays to have dual knowledge. So if you can get involved in TV and radio, those things are linked in, in careers now. They really are. Uh, I do a lot with TV, and we have TV people cross over and do radio. Um, I'm sure you see that up in Green Bay as well. It's useful. I mean, the more beneficial you can be to a station, the more useful the it, better. It really is, and you, you see so much, you hear so much now about multi-platform journalists. <laughs> um, you gotta go out and you gotta write your own stuff, shoot it. Um, and edit everything uh, for yourself. So very much true. You got to diversify. Steve, I'll, I'll I'll start with you on this question. Um, was there, and maybe this doesn't apply, maybe it does. Um, but were there any minors that maybe you pursued temporarily, or maybe graduated with a minor that helped you in your career today? Yeah, you know, excellent point. I, I was a business minor, and when I was here, it was. You know, accounting one, accounting two, accounting three, and accounting four, that was business. And I didn't want to be an accountant, but I run a business every day. And whether you're freelance or whether you run a production company, part of my day, a great portion of my day is doing business. And I mean, it's a creative business, but it's still business. So, you know, entrepreneur class, accounting classes, learn how to, learn how to read a spreadsheet, you know, some contracts, those kind of basic things are really valuable, even for employment at a station or being a freelancer or owning a television production company, that business does help. Anybody else have a minor that maybe helped them out? I just have to echo Steve, because I was too a business minor, and uh, Oshkosh is known for its business school, and, and for good reason, and uh, I am a freelancer, but because of that, ultimately I am the CEO of my own company. And even if you go out and you have an agent who represents you, I mean, they get a 10% commission. Effectively, they are 10% of your company. Who runs the other 90%? You do. So to really have a very strong business sense, um, you know, and, and some of that's intuitive, but a lot of it, you know, can, you know, be learned, especially on the marketing side um, and entrepreneurial side. So uh, I have to say, absolutely, that yeah. was a good choice for me anyway. In my world, which is a creative world, more is business sometimes than it is creative. I wish it was more creative, but you know, 60-40 is sometimes 60 business and 40% the creative aspect of it. So um, yeah, that's something I really push for. I actually picked up uh, Spanish. I started out with a ma minor and then made it a major. And I think that if you're going, I know languages aren't for everybody, but if you're going into mm -hmm. a bigger city, it's one way to make you more marketable because you have that capability to translate or, or do anything. And I had a journalism minor. I try to advise students nowadays to get a business minor, um, or if you're interested in news, political science or history or those types of things, just for that well-rounded background. Yeah, I, I did a, a double minor. Uh, one was marketing and, um, and one was coaching. I, I honestly, I didn't know how long it was going to stick in, in the profession, if I was really going to love it once I got outside of the walls. Um, but I did, but I had that background of coaching if I wanted to go to sports administration. And then also marketing. I, mean, I, I was part-time at the station I started at for 10 years before I was full-time. 10 freaking years. So, <laughs> but I loved it. I mean, it was a lot of weekend gigs, but I needed a job. I needed something sustainable. Um, so I had a marketing job where I traveled the country with great clients. And if I didn't have that background as well, business acumen may have not been there to get that job. So. Uh, it's important, I think, to diversify yourself as well. So business, anything along that line um, that can help broaden you a little bit uh, is going to be critical, I think. Great. Okay, I'm going to ask some questions now. <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> Steve, we're going to start with you. Um, what RTF experiences set you apart um, when you were applying for jobs? I'll tell you, probably the biggest one was the student um, television show. It was called This Week at the time, but it was a weekly newscast. And, and actually, when I was here, they paired me up with another guy as a co-producer of the show. He's still my business partner. We've been together like 30 years in business. And I met him in this studio 
doing this week and still a, a best friend and uh, a business colleague from for myself so it started for us in this studio working here great great well, you got to talk to people and when people come back like what we do i mean i want to spend time talking to you guys afterwards because y'all looking for internships you need to have internships leverage the context that you build you know ask me how to make a resume ask these other guys how to make a resume and what goes on it and how to make it look right you have to leverage your networks and you, you, that's what allowed me to get an internship at the station i started at and that turned into a, a job but ultimately a full-time job and career so had i not had that i don't know that i would have interned and I don't know, you know what I mean? Like your whole life could change if you don't, you know, build that little network and pick people's brain. Yeah, Dana? I will definitely echo that. Um, contacts were huge in getting my job at Channel 12. Um, but it's not just your contacts within this major, I don't think. I think it's contacts in with anybody that you run into because you never know. They may say, oh, I know somebody who thinks you might be good for this job. Besides that, it really helped a lot that I was fortunate enough to have the experience to do the video, to do my writing, to do my own editing. Uh, that's huge. Even if you go to a news station where they start out giving you a photography, that doesn't always happen nowadays so having that knowledge and being able to practice all those years just takes you one step further. So. Yeah, and I, I have to echo what everybody else is saying I mean getting that good practical experience here um, you know it's people like Steve that I remember you know spending all their time in these facilities that's great you get excellent experience and learning uh, opportunities here eventually then you got to take it to your next step and uh, to be able to go out and interview for internships um, you have that experience here, I think it's going to take you to that next step. And then once you get your internship, you know, then it's up to you. For what I do uh, as a cinematographer, your demo reel is so, so important. Mm -hmm. So what do I have coming out of Oshkosh? What have I done, you know, to show? And uh, yes, what you have on paper is important, but what you can show is the most important. And um, maybe I'll get into this a little later. I didn't have a website coming out of here, something I definitely should have had. Uh, but I did have a demo reel, you know, and I had you know, DVDs that I could pass around to people. And it was those projects, one after the other, um, kind of the final projects that I did, not so much the ones I started out doing, uh, making a lot of mistakes. But um, uh, the work that I did here was a stepping stone to you know, more professional work on down the line. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you had some great projects when you were here. Um, is there anything you would add to the department? Web design, <laughs> uh, to be honest. And, and I know it, it may not be a, a, a directly fall under the you know, radio, TV, film umbrella. And uh, if not here, somewhere else on campus. You know, I really feel, but again, I mean, this is, it's catered to you know, working as a, as a freelancer of any kind. You really are in charge of your own marketing. And nowadays, um, you know, it's even though you can put something on a DVD, by the time you send it with a courier to, you know, go across, you know, town to someone's office, they've already looked at three things online. And uh, so the ability to build and manage your own website is, is really uh, key in the sense that, you know, you don't have to rely on somebody else. And it's, you know, if you can do it yourself, it's much more cost effective that way, too. Mm -hmm. Bill, is there anything you'd add? Uh, I agree with Mike. Um, I think the web is where a lot of the news is going these days. I mean, everything is so web-based. Everything we do goes to the web eventually, if not first. So I'd like to see a little bit more uh, emphasis on the web. I get a lot of students from Oshkosh that do apply for internships, and they don't seem to have that. So I would uh, encourage the school to look at that. Okay. Dana? As far as equipment wise, I felt very prepared when I was at Channel 12 with their cameras. Yeah, they were somewhat different, but the basics are the same. Editing, I knew exactly what to do, so that was great. I will have to, not to be a broken record, but have to emphasize what they're saying as well, um, because a lot of people don't necessarily go right to TV for their news anymore. They'll go right to the website, and you know, it's so important to have that knowledge because of the way technology is going. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's equally important as ra in radio. Um, but the philosophies that were taught here when uh, Ben Jarman was teaching, and I don't know if they're continuing, but uh, everything is digital. Everything is, you see a waveform in a file, you can see where you're clipping and cutting and trimming and editing. But the way we were taught was to spin something on a reel. It was a nine minute piece, you had to edit down to two minutes, because it teaches you to edit with your ears, okay, not with your eyes. It's so easy to do. Um, and really be an artist with your editing. So. That's really important. I think maintaining that philosophy, I think, is, 
is critical, but I can't echo enough on the web because everything is cross-platform. Everything needs to go to the web, podcasts, everything. It's, it, you drive people to the website because in our world, it's another form of advertising and you can monetize the website. So they're always trying to get clicks, story count is high, and drive people through that to share content. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I think maybe just take another direction. I think as you're a student here, you'll hear a lot of people talk, a lot of people talk about, you know, develop contract contacts, work those contacts. How do you really do that? I mean, how do you network? How do you do that? I always thought a class on networking would be really valuable for students to have. And, you know, how do you work LinkedIn? How do you work to that to your advantage? You know, this is a business that's different than nursing or education where you send a resume in and you wait to get that call back from the hospital for the job. And, I, I talk to a lot of students and I always kind of tell them, in this business you have to find a way to work yourself to the front of the line. Not being rude, not cutting in line, not you know, doing something inappropriate, but you have to find a way to work yourself to the front of the line. A lot of that's contacts and just finding ways to do that is, uh, I, I think, almost a class in itself. Mm -hmm. Greg, uh, I'll, I'll pose this question to you first and have everybody else uh, respond. Getting to the topic of internships, you stressed the importance of them earlier. Mm -hmm. What do you think, in, in getting your internships, how did you make yourself as appealing as possible to try to get the best ones that you could? Uh, I met a guy at a bar. Uh, <laughs> it, it, no joke. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was a, a friend of mine who was in the fraternity I was in, and it was an alumni thing, and the guy's name is Doug Russell. He came back, and I met him, was introduced, told him I wanted to be a sports intern at TMJ, and he was a producer at that point. Um, so I applied it formally, and, and it worked out. You know, it's... I want to be able to do the same thing for people who are looking for the same thing that went through the same program that I went through. Um, and then my intern supervisor was Doug and a guy named Len Casper, who is now the TV play-by-play -play guy for the Cubs. So I, I learned under those guys and had a blast. I, I would go to Brewers games. I would go into the locker room afterwards. I would get sound. I would cut it up for their post-game show. And that was my internship, and it was great. But if I hadn't had that, if I hadn't met Doug, if I haven't leveraged that contact, it may not have materialized, and that paved the way for job number one. Um, and then I had a separate internship that wasn't even related to the business because it was more related to marketing, but that was an opportunity to travel the country and set up golf tournaments for kids. So just another way to broaden yourself beyond just your major, because you can get very tunnel focused on what you do inside these walls, but it's, it's really important, I think, to have a clear understanding with uh, everything else that is out there and uh, potential career opportunities. And Dana, what about you? Were you meeting people in bars for your internships <laughs> or did you go a different route perhaps? Not necessarily, um, but I think I didn't wait for people to call me. I didn't expect them to call me. It's not that you want to keep pounding them and call them every single day, but in this business you need to be persistent and you need to have confidence in your stuff. That's actually one thing that was hard for me because I'm a perfectionist and what I do in my stories for me were never good enough. I had to work at having that confidence and saying, you know what, it might not be perfect now, but it's a foundation and you build on that and be confident in when you present what you have because this is the stage that you're at and if it's if you put your best foot forward then that's all anybody can ever ask of you. Um, as far as applying for a job now that we talked about internships what's the what's the main factor in doing that what's the one thing that you have to do on that job application in order to make yourself stand out from everybody else and I'll start with Michael. Well uh, the thing about that is you have to it, it's a it's a case by case person by person thing because at least for me, what is it that makes you unique as, as a cinematographer, as a filmmaker, um, is not necessarily what makes me unique. Um, sorry. And uh, so, you know, really play to your strengths. Decide, you know, what it is that you really, you know, think that you're good at or, or you know, a direction you want to go in and just really pump that up. Um, you really are what you say you are. And that's, uh, you know, that can be a tricky thing because, you know, at some point you're going to have to take an opportunity, accept a job that you may not have the full confidence inside that, you know, you know it forwards and backwards, but it's that leap of faith, you know, that confidence in yourself that you're going to figure it out um, that's really going to, you know, kind of take you to the next level. And so you kind of figure out what direction you want to go in and then you say, that's what I'm going to do. And someone says, can you do this? And you say, yes, I can do this. And then you quickly research how you're going to do it. You know what I mean? Like, there's something to be said for, you know, taking a risk now and again. 
Bill, you do, uh, uh, looking at this from a different angle, you do a lot of the staffing um, where you currently work. What do you look for when applicants apply? Um, I think it's very key <clears throat> when you come in and maybe you've had an internship um, to identify what you want to do. I get so many people I hire for, uh, you know, some of our, our part, either our part-time positions or full-time writer editor positions are entry-level jobs. Um, and I ask the uh, applicants, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And so many people say, I just want to get my foot in the door. And it's like, well, you got to talk to me a little bit more than <coughs> that. You got to tell me what do you want to do? Because if you want to be a reporter, you're applying for this position, this is a great foundation, this writer editor job for you to be a reporter or a photographer with the editing. Um, so don't be afraid to tell somebody what you really want to do. A lot of times I'll, ask, I'll try to ask people, you know, what is your dream job? What would your dream job be? Um, just to kind of try to get people to open up a little bit. But, you know, I, as an interviewer, I shouldn't have to get the person to open up. They should already be uh, opening up to me. So think, you know, keep that in mind. Find out what you really want to do and don't be afraid to mention that, even if you're, uh, it's not the job that you're applying for. And anybody else uh, have any interesting, perhaps, interview stories, whether you interviewed somebody or maybe for a job that you were applying, and anything that was maybe noteworthy and has stuck with you? I guess the things that I pay attention to, um, if you're a good writer, you know, a good resume and a good cover letter, I think if, it, if I can have one thing that I would like to be focused on more for students graduating, it's, it's good business writing. Um, I think in the age of Twitter and texting and all, email and all that kind of stuff, writing skills have gone down the tubes. And if, if you're a good writer, you can display that in a couple pieces of paper. In our world, I think it really helps get a good sense for where you might be strong. You know, maybe you're going to write promos that will give you that opportunity or, or write a newscast or a sportscast. You know, add captions to the web or do something creative and kind of interesting. Play off that strength. But if you don't showcase that right away and there's 15 other applicants, you, you've already wasted time. You, you've got to be a good, solid business writer. I think just to add to that, um, good news is we don't really look at grade point average very often when we hire people. So. There's a reason we're all on radio, TV, film, obviously. So we, we get that, trust me. Uh, but I think, you know, branding yourself, when you walk in right away, you're branding yourself when you walk into a meeting. So I can kind of get a feeling of where you are. And we're looking for people with passion. You know, we're looking for people that really are driven to be in this business and are passionate about it. That's really one thing I'm looking for right away when we hire people. And uh, with that comes along with working more hours than you'll get paid for. I mean, that's where the passion and dedication comes in. Um, Steve, I, I want to pose this to you. Uh, when you were in college and student here, uh, when did you start looking kind of beyond college and looking at what you might be doing, when starting applying for jobs? When did you start doing that? Was that until after you graduated? Oh, no, or sophomore, you start or junior year starting. And my first internship was at Channel 11. Quick story, um, weekend job, Channel 11, 12 students were there. UWGB had some students there. Oshkosh had some students. I think we were getting five bucks an hour to work weekends and at one point the news director came down and fired the whole group of us, all 12 of us, and said we can't afford to pay you guys anymore, we're sorry the internship program is over. Tragic news, we're just getting our foot in the door at this business. I remember we all walked out to our cars and we're getting ready to leave. I turned around back and talked to the news director and said I want to work here so bad, don't worry about the five dollars, please just keep me here in this position. And 11 people went away that day, I was the only one that went back. And quite honestly, I've never seen these that 11 people in the business. So it's one of those stories of basically just trying to find a way to kind of cut in line again, like I talked about earlier, but just trying to find that first internship, that first foothold that you can start building from. Let's move on and talk about uh, your big break, your, your breakthroughs into the industry. I'll start with, with Steve. Uh, when did you get yours? Uh, and tell us a little bit about it. You know. My, my colleague, Mike Trinkline, uh, the, the guy that graduated from here also, we talked about this earlier today, we went through the questions, and he said, you know, this big break concept is sometimes a misconception. I think every moment you're kind of in this profession is kind of small breaks that work into a bigger break. So I think if you're waiting for that big revelation to hit you, it doesn't always work in this business. And I think, you know, today is one of these small breaks. You guys are here on a Friday afternoon, which is huge, I think. I remember Doc Schneider, one of our first teachers in radio TV film said, I remember the pit class, intro to radio TV film said, look around, 10% of you people are gonna be working in this business, the other 90% are done for. And that stuck with me my first day as a freshman, I still remember that, and you guys are already in that 10%, I think, that are here, which is huge. Um, so, um, 
I'm not sure what the question was, but am I close? <laughs> am I close? Good <laughs> break. I, I would say you're nailed it. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm, I guess good. I'm not a big believer in that. It happens to some people. I mean, like this guy, every day is a big break for him. But <laughs> I, I, I am not really huge. I, you know, there are moments that I kind of go like, oh, this is a big moment. But I think it's all the things you make along the way that make the breaks. It's a lot of work. I mean, you just have to put your time in. I never once thought when I was a student how little money I'd be making in radio. I just loved it. I loved doing it. And uh, it just kind of built up. And at, at one point I said, well, I'm ready to, to, you know, maybe move on to television now. Not that radio is a step down or anything, but it, it's just you put so many hours in and you do it because you love it. And you either know you want to do it or you don't, you're not going to do it. Um, I, I always say there's no middle ground that you th think that you're going to eventually learn how to love this business. You either know it right away or you don't. Nothing happens overnight. Uh, I have to agree uh, 100%. I mean, this big break concept is, is strange to me because, uh, you know, it's, it's for me, you know, you start with a very small network, a small amount of work that you have to show, and over time, both of those things should grow, you know, as, as you move along and as your network gets larger and as, you know, your work, you know, expands, uh, things start to add up. And, you know, someone will say to me, well, how did you get this opportunity or how did you ever get that job? And I oftentimes find myself, I mean, I'm long-winded as it is, but there's a litany of things that, you know, I can tell that person. It's like, you know, it's a series of events. It's never like, oh, I just rolled the dice and it happened. It, it's just not how it works. So what I'm hearing is, for most of you, would say it's your body of work that you put together during your college career and then maybe your first few years after college. That's essentially your big break. It's one big, long process. I think just in time, the more that you do, the more eyes see what your work is, the more ears hear what your work is. You know what I mean? You, you just expose it to more and more people. Um, I mean, I, I was told by a program director at WTMJ that I would never be on the air. I was hired to be a producer, and that was my role. And people that apply for WTMJ jobs typically uh, are coming from other markets and uh, view it as a desirable place to work. That was all the motivation I needed. I mean, I was an athlete in college. That, that was enough for me. Uh, that was my goal now to make it, make his words false. Um, and, and I did have one, I guess, catapult, and that was being on a, a TV show uh, on ESPN. I never would have dreamed that, but it was cold one day, and I didn't want to go for a run, so I applied to be on a reality show. And next thing you know, I was in South Beach with eight people I'd never met trying to get to Mount Rushmore with no money or food or ID. Uh, it was crazy. Uh, <laughs> but shortly after that, I got a weekend gig. Cool. Now, there was a little bit more of a, a profile, I guess, and that helped kind of get my foot into the door, and I was able to make mistakes at a, a good station and, uh, and learn and work my way up. And then, you know, after time, more people hear your work, and all of a sudden, I'm doing stuff for Pro Football Weekly and, you know, doing charity events with Donald Driver. It's just like, what, what, when did that happen? Like, it just, it, over time, it just collects, and you look back on it, and it was a quick, quick time frame from 2001 until now, but, uh, but it was all worth it. Um, what are uh, maybe some things that you do uh, within the industry that you work in that you didn't realize were a part of it until you started working in it? In other words, something maybe you weren't told here while you were a student, uh, something uh, maybe in your internships that you never realized, but once you got out there in the real world, maybe you realized something about your industry that, uh, that you hadn't realized was a part of it. Working in the film business is not a career, it's a lifestyle. This is really important. If, if, if I were to start teaching a class at UW Oshkosh, you know, Film 101, what have you, I would sit down with a body of students and I would say, this is what you're in for. And I'm talking from a lifestyle standpoint, you know. These are the kind of hours you might work, you know. This is the kind of schedule you might be faced with. If you're looking for a nine to five office job, this is not it. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because it, it permeates far more, it extends far beyond, you know, your life, as, uh, your professional life. It, it, it permeates into your personal life and, and your family life and other things that, you know, you want to do. Uh, you know, there's only so much time in a day. And, you know, the first set I ever set forth, you know, set foot on in L.A. was a 17-hour day, you know. And I was so excited and so wide-eyed that, you know, it could have been a two-hour day in my mind. But in reality, it's like... You know, if I want to, you know, have a family and, and I want to go to a soccer game at 7 o'clock on a Thursday evening, how can I, I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just saying it takes a lot of work. 
to massage your professional life and your personal life and just striking the right balance is, is a challenging thing. That being said, the amount of freedom I have as a freelance professional is immense. You know, I, if I don't want to take a certain job, I don't have to, and it's not going to be the end of my career. You know, I can really pick and choose how I want to structure my schedule. But that comfort, you know, zone that some people need, you know, professionally, you know, that salary that you're guaranteed to make X amount of dollars every year does not exist. And so as long as you're okay with you know, that, uh, you know, mystery of, of, you know, how is this year going to play out versus last year and, you know, the next year. Um, you know, as long as you're okay being flexible, there's a lot of freedom, but there's also, you know, the potential for a lot of variety, good and bad. Um, so you just need to know that it's as much a lifestyle choice that you're making to work in the film business as it is, uh, you know, a career. And Dana, I can tell by your reaction, you, you totally agree with the, the lifestyle comment. I do agree it's a lifestyle. There are plenty of days that I've worked 12 hour days. You don't get paid for that 12, full 12 hours. You don't get paid overtime. You're expected to put in your time, get your story done, and get it on the air and do it all over again the next day. And, and you sometimes, work weekends too. And I do. I do work weekends. My shift is Friday through Tuesday. Friday, Monday, Tuesday, I work 9 to 7. And Saturday, Sunday, 2 to 11. And when we have football games, it's even later than that. So uh, it's just, it's crazy. He's, he's absolutely right. It is completely a lifestyle. But if you're passionate about it, it's, um, it's well worth it. It has a lot of advantages. One thing I wasn't prepared for, and I think someone mentioned earlier, you're kind of in a little bubble here. And one thing I wasn't, I've never seen anyone run so fast away from a camera in my life as when I had to go out and get man on the street interviews. Everybody sees the camera and they know, I know exactly who you are, and they run the other direction direction because they don't want to be on TV. So it's kind of funny how, you know, you see the personalities that are for it and people, it just doesn't always work. Yeah, the industry doesn't stop. There are holidays, I think, on the calendar, but they don't stop. <laughs> like radio, it's still a radio show that day. You know, the Packers play on Thanksgiving. They play on Christmas. That means I'm working. Um, it's just part of the deal, you know, and you have to accept that. I, I think it's running a television production company. And also, I've, I've been in your shoes a lot as a freelancer also that, Every morning I wake up and I'm unemployed. You kind of get this feeling that I got to get out of bed. I got to drive business. I have to kind of create a, a business. And uh, when I was a freelance, I felt that way. Even as a television production company owner for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I still feel that motivation to kind of like today, I feel like I have to make something happen. Do you, feel that way in the, do you feel that way in the morning? Like when you get up some days, like I got there are really days kind of and there, thing. there's some days where it's like, man, I'm glad I don't have to yeah. go to work today. <laughs> so. That's true. That's true. I'm Wednesday, middle of the week. I'm unemployable right now. I know that I cannot work at a real job anymore. I know that I cannot go to an eight to five job. I'm totally unemployable. Well, I think that that's a very interesting point because radio, TV, film, it's all so segmented. I mean, I do our morning show. I'm up at 4 a.m. Monday through Friday. I mean, it's brutal. Are you kidding? But I'm home at nine taking a nap. You know what I mean? Then it, it's very, very strange to, to, to work in that world. You have days off during the week. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's such a, a crazy different schedule and so segmented. People are coming into work at 9 at night and leaving at 8 a.m. the next morning. I just, it, it's, it's hard to identify with. And some people love those shifts. Some people can't stand it. They're trying to use it to get to something different. But you just have to understand it. it you, you don't go in at 8 and leave at 5. Everything is very, very segmented. I just want to point out, uh, we do pay our reporters overtime. So it's not <laughs> all the <laughs> <people. laughs> no. no, there are, you can't take some Where's that? Get there. <laughs> you will be compensated at some point, hopefully, if you stick with it. Our stations enough. can have a communication. Wow. <laughs> the federal government does <laughs> mandate that if you work, you know, certain hours, you do have to be compensated. If you work a 17 hour day in my business, you will be handsomely compensated. Sometimes that's not even worth it, though. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, you know, it, uh, but it's all about your own personal choices. I mean, at the end of the day, you are in charge of your own destiny. So. Um, what kind of specific hurdles have you guys had to overcome to get to the point where you are right now? Uh, you know, I would just say just going to a larger market right off the bat instead of, um, working my way through Rockford or Dubuque, Iowa, or you know, something like that. Uh, it, conventional wisdom tells you that you start a small market and you start working up. I didn't know if I'd love the industry that much to do that, and I was from the Milwaukee area, so I figured if nothing else, I'll work at a bigger station, see what it's all about, and at worst, I'll have made some contacts and maybe leverage that for something that might be a different path. Uh, but I loved it, and I was willing to stick it out. 
and I love the Milwaukee area, so it, it, it worked. But that was a hurdle because it, it's part-time right away, and you have to be willing to accept that, and it's competitive, and you just have to understand what you're getting into. Um, so I think that's a hurdle, just working through that, being able to be part-time and have a, you know, a dollar figure slash per hour next to your job title instead of a, a salary number. Um, that was one. And then, you know, management that doesn't have faith in you, uh, I don't tolerate that. Dana? I think the first job is always the hardest to get. Um, not that the other ones don't have their challenges, um, but getting that foot in the door to have have someone take a chance on you sometimes is, is hard to get. It took me two years to get the job that I have, and I'm so grateful for it. And the only reason why I have it is because of people that I knew that put in a good word and recommendation. So burn, not burning your bridges is always important. I think for us the biggest commitment or the biggest challenge we have is we are firmly based in Milwaukee. We, we made this decision as a company. We're not moving to the coast. And um, we go to Los Angeles and New York and get a lot of contracts from networks and bring them back to Milwaukee. But we are constantly having to fight and, and um, for, those, for that work and be able to do it in Wisconsin. That's probably been our biggest challenge. And we face it every day. Once again, we want to remind everybody that you are watching and or listening to Pro Perspectives here on Titan TV Channel 57 and 90.3 WRST-FM. Our guests today are Steve Betcher, Greg Matzik, Dana Blado, Bill Kiefer, and Michael Nye. I want to move on to uh, sort of talking about um, once you do have your foot in the door, once you uh, are in your industry and you have that first job, I know you want to go above and beyond what it requires to do to advance, but what are some of those things that you can do to show management, to show those in charge uh, of your work, to show that you can take on more responsibility and advance in the industry? I think it's all about engagement. <laughs> you have to be engaged. You have to show a willingness and a desire to your, uh, to your managers that you want to do things and let them know. Don't be afraid to tell them that uh, you want to participate and take the next step. Yeah, initiative. I think it's really important. Don't don't have somebody come to you and if you feel like you're a good writer and you can write a nice promo or um, you want to do stand-ups or, or something on the web, even a little webisode cut thing, don't let somebody come to you. D explain that that's a desire and that you just want to showcase your ability and um, you know, d have them help you find a way to do it. You know, people don't come to you. Management is not trying to figure out how can I get this entry-level reporter a little bit more work or what can I do for the intern today? You know, that's not their focus. You know, help them make that their focus, work with them, you know, work with management. And I think it's important too, and if you're working with someone who is not giving you those opportunities, don't let that discourage you. If you think you can do it or know you can do it, go to someone else and, and try to work with them. Don't just, you know, uh, take the first person that's gonna, that's gonna turn you down, you know, keep at it. When I started out at the television station, I, I, just, I never left at five o'clock when my day was done. I kind of hung around, talked to other people, and I see a lot in the industry that people that are really engaged don't want to go home at 501 and they want to hang around and they learn from other people. Uh, we were with some actresses filming something last week and I could tell this actress had talked to DPs in the past. She knew where her key light was, she knew how to work her key light and she learned that by talking to the DP. She knew microphones. This was an actress that knew the craft well just beyond acting. She didn't want to just show up, do her lines and leave. She understood the workings of a set and I think you know whatever skill set you're pursuing you have to learn more jobs around that skill set. You have to understand what those jobs are. Yeah, and you have to be enthusiastic and you have to be confident. Um, again, I mean, if you don't believe in yourself. I think especially where you are, too, yeah. being in L.A. I mean, totally it, is, different. it is so competitive. You know, you really have to figure out what it is that makes you unique. And uh, you really have to want it. Um, that's, you know, that's really at the core. Uh, Michael, a uh, question I'll ask you since you work uh, in the business. Would you recommend a freelance career to maybe uh, some of the students who are here today contemplating that? Because I don't know you personally, I can't answer that question uh, for any student out here. But uh, I will say that if you enjoy flexibility, if you like that unconventional lifestyle and you really enjoy your freedom um, and you really like to kind of, you know, make make things flow the way you know you want them to flow and not be you know your schedule is really dictated by you um, you know in between projects anyway and uh, I would say it's fantastic and I can't I could never work in an office you know in a cubicle 
you know, nine to five. I just, I can't, you know, I'd go crazy. And, um, and I can't stand fluorescent lights. <laughs> so like, uh, you know, so for me it's perfect. And, and, and for some other people, if you have a real sense of adventure and you know, you're really you know, in for something unique, absolutely. Um, but you know, if you have four mouths to feed, then you might want to think twice. I mean, I don't know. But I think as a freelancer, I mean, you have really unique skill sets, I think. And we hire a lot of freelancers, but the ability to go from a set to set to set, working with different people, you have to have strong skill sets and strong people skills to be able to do that. So I, I think it's a very unique calling, I think. Um, looking at how the job market is today, Greg, you kind of touched on this a little bit before. Is it, is it important to um, be more specialized in a specific area, or is generalization more important? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the person that would be hiring you may not know your specialties and may not know how they translate to that station. Um, so the ability to come out of any kind of program and communicate that you were able to be on, a, uh, be on the news set, be behind the anchor desk, it did work with the chroma, uh, chroma key, it did work behind the mic on the radio, I wrote promos for our station, any sort of management, it, that shows your initiative, that shows your drive. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing I, I want to learn in a conversation that I would have with um, a potential employee or an intern. Figure out what your level of involvement was, not, well, I'm just looking for a job. It, people can see right through that. Don't be the one who's desperate to find a job. And I, I think you hit it right on the head when you said, well, I just want to get my foot in the door. You're just saying that you want a job. You're not saying that you know, Channel 11 and Green Bay is going to be the right fit or WTMJ is going to be the right fit. Let's work and figure it out if it is or not. You know? And if it's not, we'll maybe try and get you in the right direction. Um, show that you've got some research. You've got some knowledge about where you're applying for. And anybody else want to comment on that too? Uh, specialization versus generalization. Steve? You know, I think a few years ago in television, you used to go out with a crew of people to cover a news story or a news event. Now sometimes the crew is one person. Mm -hmm. You're doing sound, you're shooting, you're reporting, you're doing a stand-up, and you're editing your story. So your skill set has become very broad, especially in television, maybe not so much in film, but in television, I think. And then you're doing web stories also. So I think sometimes, you know, the greater your skill set, the greater your employment. Film is not a singular, uh, you know, endeavor. Uh, it is a collaborative, you know, mechanism, art form, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it takes an army to make a film. And if you ever try to make a film and do everything yourself, you know, maybe a little Rod Robert Rodriguez style, you know, you're going to find that, you know, it takes a lot out of you. And you might prefer, you know, the way that most people make films, and that is you get a crew together and everyone has something to contribute. In that way, uh, to be specialized in one particular area will serve you well because you're going to reach a point where, you know, people are going to, you are what you say you are. So, you know, people know you as one thing, and then if all of a sudden, you know, you're something else, they're like, wait, but I thought you... And, and the thing is, because it is so competitive and because there are so many people in the industry, you know, vying for various jobs, if you can really hone in on one area, you know, I think it's going to benefit you to, uh, to move in that direction. Now, if that's not a direction you want to move in, you know, choose your direction. But, you know, once you have, go for it. I have a question for you, Michael. It's a little different. Um, Everybody here except you is working in Wisconsin right now. What's your opinion on um, kids moving out to LA right after they graduate? Should they do that? Should they stay here? Like, what's your opinion? The time to kind of take the temperature on that is not after you've graduated. Like, for me, it was very important to go. I, I got in my car, I drove out to Los Angeles. This was, you know, after my second year of school. And it was to, you know, spend some time on some professional sets and really kind of get a sense of what that world was. Um, I had a good enough experience. It was positive enough that I said, this is, you know, some place that I could come back to and I can start my career. If I didn't have that feeling, probably the next year I would have driven out to New York and I probably would have, you know, you know tried to, you know, test that market a little bit and see if that's something I wanted to pursue. Um, Chicago due to its proximity is, is very, you know, appealing uh, in, in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, all of my family is in the Midwest. You know, I come back here a lot. I like it here. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't running away from anything. Um, 
I just had a really good experience uh, going out and kind of testing the waters. And so that was the summer, you know, while I was still in school. I came back, you know, I finished up school, and then I made my way out there. I think uh, the mistake is, you know, saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do, but not really having a sense of what that is or what that world is. And so you really have to, you know, kind of get your feet wet before you really pack the car full of everything that you own, which I did, and then drive on out there. Mm -hmm. well, we were talking before the program about a guy I know who went out there, <coughs> no idea what he really wanted to do, and I thought you had a good point about you'll find the work, but you may not find what you really want to do. Yeah, and, and it's really easy to get a, a job in the film business. It's, it's, that's super easy. Uh, to do what you want to do, as I was telling you, is that's the challenging part. You know, to really focus in on you know, something that you're going to feel good about doing for a long time. Um, you know, if you want to work as a PA for the rest of your life, I c we can make that happen overnight. But that's no life for anybody as a career, so, um, you know, something to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, Steve, what made you decide to stay in this area and not go to L.A.? Um, that's a really great question. I, I think it's just more of a family commitment and a family decision that, that, that we made, um, my wife and I and our children, and we decided to raise kids here. I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles for work. I'm back and forth every other week pretty much for the work that I do. So um, I guess we kind of live both worlds pretty well, and um, we actually bring a lot of work out of Los Angeles to Milwaukee. Our crews in Milwaukee do it, and it's just economically smart for the networks to hire us, and it's worked really well for us. You can do it. You can do it. Mm -hmm. are, are there any maybe people that you met in your careers, maybe even at UW Oshkosh here, that have sort of influenced the way that your careers have gone and maybe had an impact on you? Anybody that would be um, maybe at your first job or in the industry or anybody that you had as a professor here, or maybe you know a, a classmate or a colleague? I have to give tribute to Al Folker, who is my advisor here. He retired a few years ago, but he, in the news anyways, was one of the ones who really kept pushing me. Oh, try this, oh, try this. And he was actually one who knows my current boss. And when I found out there was an opening here and it wasn't an entry-level position, it said required previous experience, which I didn't have. And um, I told him that, and he says, oh, but I, I know Heather Shallock. Call her up, and who she's a graduate here, too, actually. Call her up and tell her I said she needs to hire you. I said, excuse me? She doesn't know who I am. But it was that kind of, that's what I did. And she was silent on the other end of the line, and my heart was pounding. I thought, what did I just do? And she said, I... I would trust Al, go ahead and send me your resume and, you know, come up here for an interview and that's what it was. So, I mean, a lot of the professors here, Doug Heil too and Ben Jarman, who also retired, great pushers of, you know, and Bill um, Kiefer, or Bill, I'm sorry, Bill Kirkhoff and Keith downstairs too in Master, really great resources. Well, uh, I want to thank everybody for offering their uh, input today. Now, we do want to take some time here to take some questions from the audience. Um, if any of you uh, in the audience do have any questions that you want to ask any of our panelists today, the microphone is right over there. You can head right over there, and we'll uh, be happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, and uh, if not, I have more questions that I would like to, <laughs> to ask. Uh, no question about that. Um, but yeah, and My Michael is uh, cheating right now and looking at them. So um, while, while we get ready for, for uh, the Q&A, um, is there anybody else that, you know, obviously you need to be take hold of your career and, and you need to be uh, an individual about it. You need to be doing everything. Is there anybody that maybe you would credit uh, to your career? And I know Dana just commented on it a little bit um, that has gotten you to where you are today. Uh, I would credit Ben Jarman. He, uh, I don't know if anybody ever worked with Ben out there at all, but he had an incredible ability to make you see a story on the radio. Um, it's not easy to do. Not only could he do it, he could communicate how to do it. And that's something that I just never thought about how to, you know, you gotta find a script and you read and you do your thing. But through his production classes, I mean, you, you learn that radio is an art. Um, you can apply your vision, you can apply all your senses to a story in the radio if you do it right. And Ben could take a story about, you know, the thigh master and make it the most interesting thing you've ever heard in your <laughs> life. I mean, he just he was incredible that way. Uh, but he was also very encouraging, and the door was always open. So I, um, I think the day that I graduated and I knew I had my job at WTMJ, I bought him a couple of cases of beer and thanked him and 
I didn't know he was in a class at the time, but whatever, it was fun. <laughs> uh, but a guy that I still try and keep in touch with whenever I can. He was incredibly influential for me. We have our first question. You can go ahead. All right. Um, I guess my first question is, what is the most valuable lesson that you've learned at UW Oshkosh that helped you uh, with your career? Anybody specifically or just, uh, just kind of everybody? General. Okay. I want to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was uh, you know, not being afraid to make mistakes. I mean, I was in school here. Obviously, it was a learning environment, um, you know, and it was great because I had an incredible amount of freedom to try a lot of different things and, and make a lot of mistakes, honestly. Um, you know, I think I looked at my demo reel coming out of here, you know, a couple of years ago, and I, there's nothing on that that is currently on my demo today. And uh, it just, it's interesting because at the time, it was like gold, right? Um, uh, but it really, it really gives you a sense of how far you've progressed. And um, for me, you know, you continue to make mistakes. You just try not to be as vocal about them when they happen, and, and you, you know, you move forward. And, and you're always learning. So uh, that never stops, especially after you leave here. I'd just like to add to that. Um, for me, it was a lot of the great hands-on experience you get here. But also, don't forget each other too. You know because I had some terrific classmates that we, we learned a lot from each other. Um, so, you know, look to yourselves as well. I mean, just one quick thought is, um, I think we're all kind of in the storytelling business, you know, whether it's um, cinematography or television or radio, that just the ability to tell a story and be able to do that well, that's a huge thing that you, you have to learn, I think, that beginning, middle, and end. And it just, it sounds so easy, but yet the storytelling technique is, you know, is something worth trying to harness. Uh, next question, Tim? Yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to commend all of you. I'd like to say you've been, it's great that you're doing, you're so successful because you were like us, all of us once at one time. But um, the question I have is once you graduate from college, I wonder if any of you have got into the situation. I know from being the elderly, non traditional student on campus that when you're out in the real world, that you don't get the job that you want at first. I was wondering when you graduated from college, um, if you got a, if you had to work someplace else other than in the field of uh, radio, television, and film, and if so, if you worked a job besides that, whether it be like waiting tables or uh, working in a factory, what can you do to um, connect with somebody so you can go into radio, TV, film, so your only interview question in your life is not, do you want fries with that? <laughs> I can definitely touch on that because right out of college I was sending my resume out to anybody and everybody that possibly offered a job in television news um, and most of them were outside of Wisconsin so I could taste a little bit of other states which I think hindered me because no one knew me so they weren't willing to take a chance. Um, it was devastating for me, absolutely devastating and I thought maybe I'm not meant to do this, you kind of go through that. But my aunt, who lives in Texas, found out about a job teaching English and Spanish. And at the time, I thought, I never saw myself living in Texas. I'd like to use my Spanish. Never saw myself teaching. But I needed, is it take a job somewhere else, or is it live with my parents until I find one, which could be two years down the road? So I packed up my car, and I left. And it was a little off path of what I thought would happen, but it was probably one of the best things that ever could have happened to me. Um, I gained some valuable contacts down there, and it worked out well because I taught year-round to adults. So on the weeks that we would have off, I would plan a trip up here then and do a road trip and call up stations ahead of time and say, I'm Dana, I'm coming up here, can I show you my resume for five minutes on my reel and get your feedback? Um, and that proved to be incredibly beneficial. Yeah, I, what I was saying before is you, you don't want to come off as being desperate when you're looking for a job. Um, the informational interview, even when a station isn't hiring, if you can find somebody and get a hold of them, and usually work it through like an HR department or something like that, and just say, hey, look, I'm going to be graduating in X amount of time, or maybe you have graduated, but you just kind of want to see what the station is like and take a tour if that's available and just you know, talk to a couple people. If they look at it from a standpoint of he's trying to find or she's trying to find a good fit versus just trying to find a job, you've already separated yourself from anybody who has just sent in a piece of paper and waiting for a phone call. You've already had face-to-face -face contact. You're already asking the right questions. Um, there's no stress on it. It doesn't feel like an interview. You're just gathering information. And they may not be hiring you know, for six months down the road, but 
if you stay on the pulse and you keep in contact, you've already put yourself above anybody else who would just send in a resume. That's a great point. We haven't really talked about job shadowing. Just go in and job shadow for a day. Um, <clears throat> if you come into a newsroom for a day, you're going to find out if you're going to uh, like it or not because it can be a crazy place. And some people will say it's for me, and others are like, no thanks. So it's a, a you know opportunity also to think about. Well, I never took a job outside of film. Um, I was unemployed for a while. And uh, one thing that I did was, in some ways you might feel like it's a step backwards, but I was in California and I didn't know anybody, which was, you know, it's a huge problem. So I started going around to UCLA, USC, the American Film Institute, and just volunteering my time to grad students who I knew were going to be, you know, graduating soon and were going to be looking for work. And, and it's like, wait, didn't I just graduate from school? Why am I working for other students now. But I mean, you have to understand what I was doing was I was slowly but surely building my network. And you know, fast forward five years, 10 years, you know, not everyone that I met, but certain people I met are doing things. And I can call them up and say, hey, you know, what's going on? And, and they'll remember me and my work ethic. And so it doesn't always materialize in financial terms, especially in the beginning, but you know, it all kind of, you know, comes together eventually. And we do have time for one more question. All right, yeah, and I'm actually wondering right along the lines of the last question, when you are applying for your first job or internship, is what would be more important, do you think, to just take the first opportunity you have or wait and be more selective about what it is? I mean, if it's something that may apply but not entirely, do you take it or do you keep looking and wait for something that's exactly what you're looking for? I say take any opportunity they offer at this, you know, early on in the internship. You can always build upon every experience. Even if it's a bad experience, you can always build upon these experiences. Yeah, if you decide to wait, you may be waiting for a while, so. Especially today. <coughs> yeah. right, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a cutthroat business. I mean, let's be real about it, too. It's, you know, one, one day you're walking into the, uh, you know, country states, and the next day it's top 40 and your key card doesn't work. Um, that kind of stuff happens. Um, so it's, it's just an... It's important, like everybody has said, get your feet wet, understand what your job, what your role is. You can make mistakes in your first job, it's okay. They don't all happen here. I make them every day in my job, so um, be patient too. Patience is the key. Dana, anything else to add as, as we close out today? I would just agree with everything that's been said. It's been great to be here and share some perspectives. And um, it's, it's context. I just I can't emphasize the context enough. And it, it's interesting. I was talking with Mike before about building that network and that rapport. And that takes time. You know, after two years, people start to know you and know your work and they know if they can trust you or not if they want to work with you or not and and that you never know where those are going to take you either it's not limited to Rhinelander for me it could span out into other states so all right well unfortunately that's all the time we have for today's pro perspectives we'd like to thank our talented panel Steve Greg Dana Bill and Michael for all of your vast knowledge experience and advice their insight will be motivational for all RTF majors and minors. We'd also like to thank the faculty and staff for teaching us the tools to be a successful asset to the industry. And finally, we'd like to acknowledge all the students who put their time and efforts into today's production. This was Pro Perspectives, a dialogue with media insiders. Thank you for tuning in to Titan TV, channel 57, and 90.3 WRST FM Oshkosh. Live from the broadcast studio here at Titan TV. We'll see you next year.